Everyone is looking for answers. Answers to both the common and the complicated matters of life. Thankfully, the real answers to all of life's questions are found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the key that unlocks these answers, providing real solutions for this life and the life to come. As you join us today, you'll discover real answers to life's most pressing questions. And you, along with us, can rejoice in the Lord. Genesis chapter 42, if you take your Bible and join us there, Genesis chapter number 42. As you turn there, some of you would recognize the, the uh, title for something that took place back really in the mid-1700s that was referred to as the Great Awakening. Uh, Whitfield and Edwards were two of the, the voices that helped fuel that awakening, but there were certainly others. And the title is insightful. If you just pause for a moment and, and try to deduce from what they called this spiritual event, you can also understand what they're saying America and actually uh, even on the other side of the ocean, England, what is it that they were experiencing? Well, there was some spiritual slumber or if not slumber, certainly sluggishness. And there was a recognition of who we are and what we're doing. There was a great awakening. Now, if you wanted to just play with words a little bit, Joseph's brothers are also about to come to a point where there is a great awakening. Now, if we wanted to play with the words, we'd say that they were about to experience a grain awakening. In other words, there was a physical circumstance, a physical hunger that God was actually using to bring about a spiritual awakening. The brothers were, were feeling maybe somewhat manipulated or how in the world could anyone know these things about us? And yet God was, in the life of Joseph, even in a pit, even in a prison, and now in Pharaoh's house, he is at this moment experiencing the reality that God is always up to something good. And with these rascals of brothers that had sold him into slavery for the price of a slave, they're also about to experience that, that there is a God in heaven who desires something better for them than they desired for themselves. The word repentance in scripture, it always carries the idea or has the meaning of to change one's mind. The corresponding Latin word is interesting. It means to recover one's senses. That's a good way to look at it, isn't it? Repentance. Have you ever come to a point of repentance where, in a sense, you came to your senses? There's an important aspect of repentance for salvation. There, there is a person who says, my way is sufficient. My way is enough. My God is enough. The God of my own making. And a person finally comes to the place where they say, that is a foolish way. There's a way that seems right, but the end of that way is death. And so they come to a place where they change their mind. That they, in, in very real ways, it's like I've recovered my senses. There is one way. There is one who is the way, the truth, the life. And no man can come to the Father but by him, by Jesus. And so a person comes to the point of saying, I changed my mind. I repent of that way. And, and to change my mind means I, I change the one that now I accept. And they become followers of Jesus, born into a new family because of the gracious offer of eternal life by Jesus Christ. But I suspect that many watching, many that are in this room, have already come to a point of saving faith, where you have trusted Jesus Christ personally. If not, today should be your day of salvation. But is there a place of repentance for those who are saved? And the answer is yes. Have you ever recovered your senses 
Have you ever seen your marriage going in a certain direction? And if that doesn't have some alteration to the course that we're on, the conclusion of that course is going to be disastrous for marriage. Have you ever seen your own life, choices that you begin to individually make, and, and you begin to follow what we might call, for lack of a better term, you might become, be, become followers of your own flesh, and, and you say, I want this, or I crave, or I desire. You, you might be, in a sense, so bound up by your own pride, by your own desire for power, by the, the collection of things, and we just keep going on away, and finally we have, oh, recovered our senses We've come to a place where there is an understanding that this way is not a good way. We remember that the first time Joseph's brothers appeared before them, they were not living in truth. They were believing a lie and they wanted to believe it. In Genesis 42, verse number 11, remember what they said regarding themselves? They said, we are all one man's sons. We are true men. We are no spies. (laughs) No, 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 no. No, Spying doesn't become us because because a a, a person who's true and honest, a man of integrity, he wouldn't spy. Now, they're trying to convince themselves of something, but they are not true men. As God forcing Joseph's brothers to be confronted with their sin they would soon understand that they're going to draw another conclusion. They weren't ready to acknowledge this to their father. But what was once only understood by them but never spoken was now offered by their own lips. Now look down at verse number 21. We'll fast forward just slightly through this story. Genesis 42 verse 21 After they're confronted, they think that Joseph can't understand their speech. Verse 21, and they said one to another, we are very guilty concerning our brother. In that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. The brothers are closer to a great awakening than they may know. The great awakening had in some way begun. An admission of guilt opens the door for further reviving. Next, Joseph sends them back home while Simeon remains bound in Egypt. Joseph's instruction was that you should go home, bring Benjamin back with you, and then we will know if you are true men as you have claimed. This is to reveal if they had learned anything Were they now willing to sacrifice Benjamin just as they'd been willing to sacrifice Joseph? So they go back home and and they do nothing. Their, Their father says, no, you cannot take Benjamin. But as food begins to run low, Judah does not offer some useless pledge by offering his sons to Jacob, as by the way, as Reuben had done earlier in this whole scenario. No, Judah offers himself as a pledge that he will bring back Jacob's son, Benjamin. Look at chapter 43, verse number eight and nine. Chapter 43, look down at verse number eight. And Judah said unto Israel, his father, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. Now, Judah had not been willing to bear the blame for Joseph. But Judah, now as this vocal representative of the brothers, says, Dad, I'm not just offering you my own sons. I'm offering you my own life. I am will bear the blame. What a great stirring of conscience and of spiritual growth was taking place in the lives of Joseph's brothers and how patiently God was bringing them to a place of true repentance, far beyond mere remorse. Now, remorse is usually sorry that we've been caught. Repentance is coming 
when my desire to be restored is greater than my fear of the cost of restoration. Remorse? Oh, I'm sorry. Usually just sorry we got caught. True repentance? Now I so desire to be restored that I want restoration more than I am fearful of the cost of being restored. So what is it that we see unfold before us in this passage? The first thing that we're about to see is the bewilderment of Joseph's brothers. These guys are absolutely dumbfounded as to the circumstances that are unfolding around them. You know, Joseph, like Christ, was purposeful in his actions with the intent of bringing his brothers back into right fellowship. That is Joseph's goal. And you know, sometimes we stand bewildered at the circumstances that are happening around us. Now today, certainly, there are circumstances that, that are taking place and we stand somewhat dumbfounded, bewildered. God, why is all this happening? Always for reasons beyond ourselves. Because God is desirous to bring us to places of true repentance and genuine restoration. Well, what were the steps that unfolded? Look at the first step that we see. The first thing is this undeserved feast. Look again, Genesis 43. And the men took that present and they took double money in their hand and Benjamin. And rose up and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them... He said to the ruler of his house, bring these men home and slay and make ready for these men shall dine with me at noon. And the man did as Joseph bade and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Do you know the first thing we see is that this responsibility is all on Joseph. He spreads this feast he bore the cost. He initiates the opportunity. He provides the sacrifice. And how beautifully we see the gospel pictured in Joseph's initiative of kindness demonstrated to his brothers. Did they deserve it? Well, clearly not. But then again, what do you and I deserve? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse number 19, we love him because he first loved us. In other words, we get this idea of love because God is the great initiator of love. When you start to think about what it is that Joseph's doing, what do you think that the brothers, when they finally show up back in Egypt again, they're there, they're with Benjamin, and now they're being taken to Joseph's house. What do you think in their mind is gonna take place when they get to Joseph's house? They're, they're, they're fearful now. They're somewhat trembling. We're, we're going to his house. This guy is the ruler of the land and we're going to his house? He may well have thought, they may well have thought, this is the, the beginning of the end. We're gonna go and, and we're gonna be made his servants in his own home. And yet in his home, there is a feast that's about to be spread before him. God the great initiator of love spreads a feast before us, not as a reward for our goodness, but as a display of his. When God says, let me, let me sit you at my table, it's not because we are good. It is absolutely because he is good. Well, look at the next thing we see in this bewildered state. We see an un deserve feast, we also see, see unconcealed fear. Look down at verse number 18, unconcealed fear. And the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, because of the money that was returned in our sacks, at the first time are we brought in that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for bondmen for in our asses. He said, he's gonna take our possessions. He's gonna take us. We're gonna go bound into his house. They were now brought into the presence of what they perceive as unlimited power. The opulence, the splendor, the visions of wealth and power are all about them. In the presence of such power, they were understandably afraid. Do you remember what it was like when, when John was ushered into the presence of the Almighty, as we read in the book of Revelation. 
He's in the presence of the king. Listen to what the Bible records in Revelation chapter one, beginning in verse 14. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as the flame of fire, and his feet like a defined brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun that shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. What happens when we are brought into the presence of God and his truth? When we are confronted with God, we become fearful. But where does true wisdom begin? To what point do I, do I have to first come before I can truly understand that which is wisdom? In Proverbs 1, 7, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This wisdom may be accepted or rejected, but it begins with a right understanding, a right respect, and a holy fear of Almighty God. In Proverbs 129, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Yeah, the brothers had become fearful. They blamed it on one thing, but that was not the problem. They were the problem. In Genesis 43, verse number 18, if your Bibles are still open there, notice what they said again. Because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time, are we brought in that he may seek occasion against us? No, 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 no. That's not the reason, guys. God, like Joseph, is always doing something bigger than you and I can imagine. Well, we do understand the the undeserved feast, the unconcealed fear. We also get this understandable formality. There, There is this formality that now begins to take place. Look at verse number 25. Genesis 43, beginning in 25. And they made ready the present against Joseph, came at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, They brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed themselves to him to the earth. They bowed themselves. This is the second time that they bow themselves before Joseph, just as Joseph had dreamed some 20 years earlier. Well, there was a formality. Certainly, there is some understood formality when we come into the presence of Almighty God. But now, look at unrevealed feelings unrevealed feelings. Verse number 30, Genesis chapter 43. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother. And he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face and went out and refrained himself and said, set on bread. Do you know what happens with Joseph is Joseph comes home from being at work, the brothers were already there and Benjamin is there. And they began to to tell the story, this is Benjamin, that he is, is now the youngest and all of these emotions begin to flood into Joseph's mind. Now think, could the brothers have understood how desirous Joseph was for fellowship with them? They couldn't begin to approach unto it. They, They hadn't even conceived of it. And yet Joseph, when all of these memories just come flooding back, Joseph just has to excuse himself quickly. And he has to find a place. He's trying to contain himself. And when finally Joseph gets to a private room in his own home, he just bursts forth with emotion. He can no longer hold it in. And he weeps aloud because of his desire for fellowship with his brothers. Now, this is certainly not unlike the desire that God has for fellowship with his own children. The Bible says in Matthew 23, verse 37, Jesus speaking, O Jerusalem, 
Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. How desirous Jesus is to say, oh, I, I, my prayer, my desire is to gather you together, to shelter you, to tuck you close to my side, next to my heart, under my wing, but you would not. Have you ever even allowed the thought to come into your mind, God, what are you doing to me? God, don't you care? And what could be further from the truth? The one who sent his own son. How could he not freely give us all things that pertain to life and to godliness? Well, we start to see the heart of Joseph, even as we more fully understand the heart of God. And then there's some uncanny familiarity. Genesis 43, verse 33. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men marveled one at another. They must have asked, how in the world could this be? And the conviction of bewilderment continues to run even deeper. And then there's unusual favor. Look down at verse number 34. And he took and sent messes unto them before him. But Benjamin's mess, in other words, the food that was placed before him was five times so much as any of theirs. This, this, this additional ongoing test of Joseph was something that he was watching very carefully. How would his brothers respond to their youngest brother who receives this unusual favor? How did they respond to Joseph when Joseph received some unusual favor? Joseph received something that nobody else got. Joseph receives this coat of many colors and they eyed Joseph because of it. They were jealous of him. They, they look at him and, and they continually... You know, they see him through different eyes that are real. And, and now they just can't wait to get rid of this dreamer, this one who comes with the favored coat. Maybe the coat even comes up when, when Joseph's walking to them, checking on their well-being on behalf of the father. Oh, here he comes. I can spot him by the coat. I hate that coat. And so Joseph now is watching his brothers. He, he wants to see how are they going to respond when Benjamin is treated with some special favor. And you know, it's interesting that they actually pass this test. The Bible goes on and it helps us understand. Look down, unrestrained fellowship. Look at number 34, verse number 34. At the end of this passage, and they drank and were merry with him. Now Joseph understands there is not some sense of, of why am I deprived what Benjamin has? Look, look at the food he gave to Benjamin and how in the world did he know to place us in this order and then he, he does this for Benjamin and only this for me. If God is sovereign and he is, then doesn't God have a right to do what he wants to do with what is his? Don't look with an evil eye because God has chosen to bless another in a way that's different from the way he has chosen to bless you. They, they I think, got past the place where, where there was some look of contempt or some look of jealousy. Sometimes we say things like, why did God not bless my ministry as he has another? Why hasn't God opened my womb? or granted the home, or offered the position, or granted the retirement, or protected the health, or given the spouse, or, and you fill in the blank. What they got past is, I don't know why he chose to honor Benjamin, but I'm okay with just being in his presence. And they didn't let another's favor disrupt the fellowship that they got to have with Joseph. And that's what we see last in this, in this, you know, bewildered state. It's just unrestrained fellowship. They drank and were merry. Not all of God's dealings with us are dark and mysterious. Here he presents that that which could be their daily enjoyment. Listen, this is what it can be. 
you can come and dine at my table. They feasted as if there was no famine. They were enjoying the presence of the great provider. They could taste and see that the Lord of this land is good. But the steps to their full restoration were not yet complete. There remained yet one other. We do see the bewilderment, but now look at the brokenness. Look at chapter 44, and let's begin in verse number one. Chapter 44, verse number one. The first thing that we see is the question, and the question is, what are they going to do with Benjamin? Again, verse number one, chapter 44. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack's mouth, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, and his corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. Joseph now wants to know, what will they do, given the opportunity, will they save their own neck, or will they save Benjamin's? Joseph's going to bring them to a place where they're going to have to make a decision, not unlike what they decided to do with Joseph. You see, for some 20 years, they have only been worried about protecting their own neck. It was all about them. In fact, it was certainly that when they sold Joseph into slavery. But now he wants to see, what are they going to do with Benjamin, given the opportunity? The first thing that we see is, is this question. They, they put Joseph's special cup in, in the, the sack of the grain that Benjamin is carrying. And now let's look not just at the question, but at the confrontation. Who will they protect? Look down at verse number 10. And he said... Now also let it be according unto your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. Then they speedily took down every man in his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. And he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Can you imagine how their heart must have fallen when one after another after another, they know there, there's no way we're going to find this cup. There's no way. And, and so one after another after another, all ten, until they get to Benjamin's sack. What must have happened? How their heart must have just fallen. And now the bewilderment certainly continues The cup was found in Benjamin's sack, and Joseph sent his servants to apprehend them. They knew that they're innocent, yet now they understood the power of something that they were also personally aware of. Now they understand the power of false accusation. Then, without hesitation, the men cast in their lot with Benjamin and agreed that his fate would be theirs. The, the person... Whose, whose sack the cup is found, that person is going back and he will be a servant. And they all agreed. Do you know what they had the opportunity at that moment to do? When the cup is found in Benjamin's sack, they could have said, Benjamin, whoa, he could have honestly said, I, I didn't put it there. I'm telling you, it wasn't me. And instead of saying, yeah, well, well you're gonna find that out back in Egypt. They said, oh, Benjamin, we're going with you. Now there was something that they were actually prepared for. The great awakening had begun. Now let's look at their confession. Verse number 15 and 16. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? Wot ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? Now, notice what he says out loud. God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. Look at verse 33. Now, therefore, I pray thee, 
Let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren, for how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. The final test is now at hand, and confession is made to Joseph of their guilt. And the reality of this confession is that Judah offers himself. He's going to make good on his word. He will not accept Joseph's permission to leave. Joseph says, okay, you guys can go. I'll keep Benjamin here. And they said, we, we can't do it. If we go home without Benjamin, our father will die. He pleads with Joseph to allow him to stay in the place of Benjamin. Now, true repentance, not remorse, had come to the brothers True repentance. Remember, they get to the place where it's not just, oh, we feel really bad about this. Now they have come to the place where the cost for restoration, so much as they know, is going to be great. I am actually offering myself on Benjamin's behalf. The cost, I don't care about the cost anymore. I just have to do what is right for the sake of my word. This brings about a genuine great awakening. So when do great awakenings occur? First, when we acknowledge our sin. That's exactly what David said in Psalm 51.3, for I acknowledge my transgression, my sin is ever before me. When does the great awakening occur? when it is followed by confession of sin. Now, Lord, I, I call it sin. I acknowledge it's sin. And now I confess. What does that mean? It means I agree with you. I, we're, Lord, what you say, I say. Whatever you say, I say. We, we acknowledge it, we confess it. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, Psalm 32, 5, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, selah, or rest. And then how is a great awakening concluded? Well, I acknowledge my sin, I agree with the Lord, I confess it, and then I forsake it. I leave it behind. Proverbs 28, 13, he that covereth the sin shall not prosper but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Do you remember at the beginning of this message, we talked about the, the great awakening in the mid-1700s. There was something that preceded it, and it demonstrated the need for a great awakening. There was actually something that was practiced by many of the churches, and it was literally called the half way covenant the halfway covenant do, do you know what it was it was exactly what it's titled hey why don't you just kind of meet us halfway they were looking for ways to engage people in church membership because quite frankly even in the mid 1700s the accumulation of wealth prosperity an easier way and now the age of rationalism and the enlightenment. And, and it was harder to get people into church. And so the church said, hey, why don't you just meet us halfway? Well, that sounds, that sounds reasonable. So you're saying, I don't, really have to, uh, I don't really have to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. I'm not stretching what it, what it caused. People could come without a clear testimony of salvation and be added to the church. Well, hey, I want my name on the rolls. Yeah, sign me up for heaven. If this thing really works, then, then put my name in there. The halfway covenant. But you know, quite honestly, halfway awakenings are still really sleepy. And you know, Joseph's brothers couldn't just say, wow, God, I know you're doing something because you're orchestrating too many events. I'll tell you what we'll do, God. We'll just meet you halfway. Isn't it wonderful that God cared too much about Joseph's brothers to allow him to only go halfway? With God, it was all or nothing. And you know, many times God is working out some awakening in our own soul. 
And he's inviting you not just to meet him halfway, but to meet him just as you are. And to say, Lord, I acknowledge, I, I'm admitting it is sin, and I'm calling it what you've called it. I, can, I confess, Lord, I agree with you. Your ways are, are higher than mine, and I want yours. Lord, help me to leave it behind. F- forgive. Restore. But once again, might I, might I again sing the songs of my salvation? I wonder if God the Holy Spirit in your own heart today has been bringing some matter to the forefront of conscience. Some matter that we've tried to tuck away and suppress and ignore and rationalize away. Why don't you meet him right where he asks you to meet him? Not halfway, but all the way, just as you are. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.